is Martha Heilman, and I'm a friend of Lynn Averill's and the creator of this event. And Lynn now has COVID, so I'm sorry she can't be here. Um, and she's really regretful she can't. She was looking forward to it so much. Um, so I will just read her remarks, and then um, we'll move on. So good evening, and welcome to tonight's panel presentation. The idea for this program came to me from a variety of different avenues. Fortunately, with the help of Paige here at the library and Kate Bryant uh, from the Bath Hill Valley Health Center in Arlington, my concept for this program easily came together. For several years, many discussions among family and friends would eventually turn to the confusion of when and how to use pronouns, how to decipher new terms, trans, binary, non-binary, then the appropriate age of transition, and why is they plural? What do other terms mean? And on and on and on. In my email at some point on the online weekly newsletter that is broadcast by the Baton Hill Valley Health Center for patients, it announced that a new certified nurse practitioner by the name of Corey Bell the uh, FNP had been accepted into their practice. It also noted that his practice would welcome patients in the LGBTQ community that needed his expertise in the field. This sparked my thinking and lack of understanding of terms, personal choices, etc. I called my primary care physician at BBHC to ask if Corey would be willing to be a guest panelist at the program for understanding. She turned it over to me and then over to Kate Bryant, the Director of Development and Community Relations, who has been extremely supportive of the panel presentation. Corey Bell accepted being a panelist. Paige agreed to hold the event at the Manchester Community Library and help with publicity. And Jess Bouchard came on board as a second panelist. And so it all came together. I'm so pleased that my idea was able to become a reality. I encourage all to listen and learn, to be knowledgeable, to help and understand others, be open even if there are still questions. And remember that we're all human beings, living in a world of many changes and many points of view. Let us all try to understand it all as best we can. And thank you very much for coming. Martha. Uh, good evening, I'm Kate Bryan, and as Martha uh, shared, I'm from Baton Hill Valley Health Center, and I'm Director of Development and Community Relations. Um, we're really excited to be here tonight and appreciate you joining us for this thoughtful, meaningful, and very important conversation. Um, I just want to do a little bit of uh, thank yous. People in development, we're thanking people all the time. <laughs> so I want to thank Paige for having us tonight in the Manchester Community Library. I want to thank Martha on behalf of Lynn for the opening remarks. I'd like to thank Alice uh, from the Collaborative, who has a lot of information and some materials that everyone can take home with them this evening. And I want to thank Gina and Auburn for helping us preserve this evening's presentation for those of uh, our community that couldn't make it in person tonight. So just to let you know, this portion of the presentation will be filmed. Uh, once we go into a Q&A, we will not be filming that anymore, just so that you're all uh, comfortable with that. So a little bit uh, of the housekeeping also before we start. We want tonight's presentation and discussion to be a place of safe um, and compassion and kindness. And so if any of you are here this evening with other intentions, I respectfully ask that you leave um, now. Uh, if you're here, you are here for kindness and compassion, and we appreciate you being here. So, now on to the main event, and getting to introduce my colleagues, uh, Corey and then Jess. So Jess, with the preferred pronouns of she and her, who's joining us via Zoom this evening, is a volunteer board member at Queer Connect in Bennington which is a four-year-old nonprofit. Queer Connect is committed to engaging with the LGBTQ plus youth. Queer Connect's purpose is to provide visibility and resources for LGBTQ plus individuals and families, and they are devoted to making that a reality for our, uh, our entire community. 
Jess volunteers with Queer Connect because she cares deeply about creating a safe and supportive community for LGBTQ youths, including her own daughters, that empowers them to live their best life and their most authentic life. She's driven to educate others and is especially passionate about topics of fertility and reproductive health within the LGBTQ plus culture. When she isn't volunteering with Queer Connect, Jess is a local trauma-informed educator as well as a Queer uh, Straight Alliance co-advisor at her school. She regularly weaves LGBTQ plus topics into her classroom to give students tools to be allies and kind humans. Cory Bell, preferred pronouns he, him, they, them, a family nurse practitioner, joined the medical team at Baton Hill Valley Health Center in July of 2021. Prior to joining BVHC, Corey spent three years providing care uh, for patients at Planned Parenthood of Greater New York and Northern New England. And during that time, he was responsible for preventative care related to sexual and reproductive health, including primary services, management of depression and anxiety, and gender affirming care. So, Corey, I turned, would um, actually defer to Jess with the time constraints. So, we might start with Jess if that's cool. Does that work, Jess? And you have the ability to share your screen and your goods, so I appreciate the kindness that you're hoping to give us with a little bit of the technology. Good to go, Jess. Great. Thanks so much, everybody. I am really excited to be with you in this capacity. Um, we live in 2023, and this is the reality. We get to do this together. Sometimes it's um, digital, and that's OK. How do I sound for folks? Great. Hey. Wonderful. So I will tell you a little bit of information before I jump in. Um, I joined Queer Connect um, three years ago. Uh, I live in Bennington. I am a teacher. Um, I actually recently became a principal of my school. So I'm now a school administrator. And I joined Queer Connect three years ago during COVID when I was feeling really disconnected from the world as a queer person. It was 2020. I was looking for ways to just feel engaged in my community as much as I could. And so I joined Queer Connect as the board president. Um, very quickly, it just it turned into um, kind of leadership for me. Um, it was digital my first year. I actually don't think I met any of my board members until the following year in person. Um, but then it turned into um, an opportunity. And so I've actually been the director of Queer Connect for the last two years. Um, right now, my capacity is a little bit different because I'm a, a school principal and it requires me um, you know, to just do different things. But I have a presentation um, for you that I hope is helpful in giving you some tools. I'm coming to this um, from a lot of different lenses. I'm coming from this as a community partner. I'm coming to this as a teacher and an educator. I'm coming to this as a mom, someone who is trauma-informed. And so I'm hoping that you leave today with some tools and then also some resources and so you know um, what you have in the community and ways to um, grow in your um, compassion. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm used to doing this. I taught on Zoom for a year and a half. And just bear with me for a moment as I move some things around. You can tell that I have a lot of um, tabs open. Um, I'm not proud of it, but it is what I have. <laughs> so my hope for today is to start thinking about affirming care. And it's interesting, I gave the same presentation actually at SVS, SVMC not too long ago. And the topic of affirming care starts with pronoun. I want to think about this bigger than just um, medical, right? I want to think about this in classrooms, at work, in the community, in different spaces. And so affirming care means we're giving um, attention and care to um, anyone that we're interacting with. So this is kind of a loose um, uh, kind of agenda for tonight. We're going to move through the, the things. Um, my hope is to spend about five minutes um, telling you about some goals, telling you a little bit about Queer Connect, um, and then defining um, the term SOGI. I want to take 10 minutes to jump into um, some local um, data that was collected by um, ACT Bennington, which is one of our um, community partners, and I'm grateful for the work that they're doing. And then I want to talk about the meat of the presentation, which is really like 
pronouns, why it matters, um, and then tips that I can give to you so that you can move through the world um, interacting with people um, you know, in a meaningful way. So goals that I have, some actual goals, so let's set them. Um, I'm a teacher, so I'm going to set some goals. Um, my hope is that you can leave today um, feeling like you understand SOGI and why it matters. So SOGI, we'll, we'll talk about it. It's another term within um, LGBTQIA. Um, I also want to make sure that folks um, in the room feel like they have some additional tools and resources for inclusive practices around uh, pronouns. You might feel a little bit more savvy. Um, I'd like uh, you to start thinking about practice and feeling confident in getting it right. And then some action steps so that you can start doing these things immediately. So you leave tonight feeling like I have a good handle on pronouns and getting it right and I have some tools. So let me tell you a little bit about who Queer Connect is. Um, we are a volunteer-based group. Um, we right now don't have any um, full-time employed people at Queer Connect. Um, our mission statement, um, as Kate was saying, is really to um, devote our time to increase, increasing the visibility in our community for LGBTQIA people um, and their families, especially children. We put on uh, we put on events all year long. One of our big ones um, is Pride, and so if you've been to Bennington Pride, um, we are responsible for organizing that. So when, originally when SVMC approached me about um, this topic of affirming care, I posed a question out to our community. And I said, what I wish my health providers knew about gender identity. And these are some of the things that I got in response. And I think honestly, again, this isn't just medical. This applies everywhere. So folks said that they wish that their healthcare providers knew that pronouns matter, that getting pronouns right in all settings is not just meaningful, it's life-saving. They also said that um, trusting that patients know themselves was important. They also said that assuming is bad, right? They also said that focus on patients' priorities, it's not um, necessarily the provider's job to have priorities, it's the patient's job to have those priorities. Um, understand each person's comfort, and then lastly, misgendering happens and how to recover. So this is really the basis for the work that we're doing, um, especially in our community when we're talking with um, medical folk. So let's just pause and let's identify this word soji. It might be new to you. Um, it's not a term that is often used, in my opinion, by the wide community. It really is um, kind of a niche word. So soji is an acronym, S-O-G-I-E. And soji starts with S-O, which is sexual orientation. So when people are talking about sexual orientation, what we're talking about is a person's physical, romantic, emotional, aesthetic, and or form of attraction to others. And so when we talk about our relationships, um, some terms that fall into um, sexual orientation would be something like heterosexual, bisexual, pansexual, lesbian, gay, queer. Um, this is someone's sexual orientation. So it's the so and the soji. And then we want to talk about the, the GI part of SOGI, which is one's personal, internal sense of their gender. So gender identity is one's internal sense of their gender as defined by that person, which can differ from their sex assigned at birth. So last slide we talked about sexual orientation. We're talking about attraction. This time we're talking about someone's gender identity, which is the sense of their gender as defined by that person. So some words that you might see would be non-binary, cisgender, transgender, gender fluid, agender. Um, there's a lot of words. There's a lot of words. And as you're learning more of them, I think really my hope is always to allow people to understand that gender identity is on a spectrum of things. And these are very personal to each person. 
So jumping ahead to the E part, so SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity, and now we're talking about gender expression. This is the physical manifestation of one's gender identity through clothing, hairstyle, voice, body, shape, etc. So now this is how someone is showing up in the world and they're expressing themselves through their body and through the things like clothing. Um, some people actually would rather call themselves gender non-conforming and this is when a person's gender expression does not conform to society's um, expectation of gender norms. So these expectations vary across cultures and have changed over time. So having that basis right now is really helpful, okay? Sexual orientation, we're talking about that attraction, that gender identity is how someone sees themselves and how they define themselves in the world. And then that gender expression is, how am I showing up in the world? Um, how am I um, carrying myself? How am I expressing myself? So with that, that allows us to think, like, why does this matter? Why does it matter that someone's sexual orientation is something that they want to share with the world? And I can tell you, as an educator, um, I think a lot about this, and I think about why it matters in the classroom, I think about why it matters in the text that we're reading. So let's dig into it together. It takes one trusting adult to save a life, and I want to tell you and expand on that a little bit more. So being an ally, um, if you want to spend a little bit more time and you want an immediate resource, the Trevor Project, in my opinion, is one of the very best um, places to get resources, especially for youth. But when I say that getting it right and why it matters, it takes one trusting adult, I can see in that room that there's some adults in there, and I can also see that there's some youth in that room. And the adults in the room right now, you have the ability to save someone's life just by being affirming. So the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to Youth Risk Behavior Sur um, Survey highlights that high rates of adverse mental health indicators among lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning students um, is higher. According to the Minority Stress Model, mental health disparities among LGBTQ youth result from increased experiences of discrimination and rejection from others. Increased support from others can serve as a pre prevention, right, as, as a, pr a protective factor, decreasing the risk for negative mental health outcomes among LGBTQ youth. And so, as someone like myself who is working in the school systems and is working in our communities doing Queer Connect, Having allies and trusting adults in all spaces is life-saving, and I can't say that enough. Um, accepting adults reduce suicide attempts among LGBTQ youth, um, who report at least having one accepting adult with 40% less likely to report a suicide attempt in the past year. Um, I think that this is truly the reason that I became an educator. I actually wasn't planning to be an educator. Um, I actually started off to be an orthodontist, um, which <laughs> might be funny to hear, um, and how I kind of worked my way into education. I think it's because of this. As a young queer person myself, I didn't have one trusting adult. And that's why I just want to put it back on the screen. Um, I, I intentionally put this. It takes one trusting adult to save a life. Um, I didn't have that, and so my goal as an educator and as a, and as a school administrator is to be that trusting adult for, for our students. So I want to bring this um, to Bennington, specific. Um, ACT Bennington, like I said, is one of the organizations that we work really closely with who does a lot of excellent work in the community. And one of the things that they did last year is that they did some data collection. Data is really important to the work that we're doing because it tells a narrative that I can't tell otherwise. We had 472 students from Mount Anthony um, High School respond to, um, to these questions. So I'm going to move through them, but there's some highlights here. One of the questions said, I have felt sad or hopeless. And you can see with your eyes um, some of that data and those numbers. And if you're looking at the colors, one of the striking things to me 
is when I see things like 0% at the end. So there's two categories. It's the non-binary, and it's the transgender, and it says none of the time. None of the time I have felt, right? So these students are saying that all of the time, most of the time, or some of the time, I feel sad and hopeless, okay? Um, I'm looking at lower numbers um, for male students who are indicating all of the time. I'm looking at things like none of the time for some other um, areas like male students, some female students. We have another category called other. But the numbers that are standing out to me the most are the ones from our non-binary and transgender youth. I want to move through another um, question. And folks, this is hard to sit with. These questions are hard. If you're someone like myself who is working directly with youth all of the time, this shatters me. I thought about hurting myself. None of the time was 56% of females, 71% of males saying that. I'm going to get smaller, but all of the time, I have 29% of transgender students who are saying, I thought about hurting myself. 29% of transgender students also saying most of the time, and then 14% of those students again saying some of the time. If you're looking up at that non-binary category, 52% of students are saying that some of the time I, yeah, I want to hurt myself, 19% of the time, yeah, I, most of the time I'm thinking about it. And then our non-binary students, 10% of them are saying, I'm thinking about this all of the time. Um, other things you can see, um, this data is presented a little bit different, but in the past year I hurt myself on purpose. 57% of transgender students are acknowledging that. 55% of other students, non-binary, 52. But as you, if you're seeing these numbers and you're doing some similar um, kind of mental gymnastics right now, you're thinking, gosh, there are some students that are more vulnerable than others. And I think it's very clear to me who they are. In the past year, I made a suicide plan. 57% of transgender students said that they had a plan um, to end their life. And again, this is the data that informs this statement. It takes one trusting adult to save a life. And that comes in so many spaces, in classrooms, in hospitals, um, in the community. So let's now dig in. I gave you some really hard things to sit with, but what comes with discomfort is also an action. And hopefully there's folks in this room right now that are feeling real fired up. They're like, no way, <laughs> not in my town, not in my community, not in my state, not in my country, not in my world am I going to be someone who is not supporting our youth. So the meat of this presentation, so we got out of the way, we have some dis discomforting things happening in our community, so let's be those allies that I'm talking about. Let's talk about pronouns. So what is a pronoun? I was an English teacher for 10 years before um, I moved into counseling and then into, um, into my administrative role. A pronoun is a word that we use in place of a noun, which refers to the people that we are talking to and about. So I or you, those are easy. She, he, um, those are the ones that are easiest for us to understand and unpack because we've been learning them in books and in language since we were children. But we need to remember that everyone has a pronoun and everybody has a pronoun that fits for them. And the cool thing is, those people get to determine that. We don't get to determine that. So if we're looking at grammar in the English language, we're talking about she and her and he and him. We're talking about those as subjects. We're talking about them as objects. We're talking about them as possessive um, things like her, that belongs to her. There, they. In the English language, we have grown up as children knowing that the word they is actually a collective, right? It's talking about a group of people. And so it makes it hard when you are someone who knows a lot about grammar and you start interacting with pronouns in a different way and maybe in a way you haven't thought about before. So let's talk more about they. I promise you, if they is complicated for you, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. So um, 
the definition that we have here says that English famously lacks a gender neutral singular pronoun to correspond neatly with singular pronouns like everyone or someone and as a consequence they has been used for this purpose for over 600 years and I think a lot about um, Shakespeare I think a lot about um, early storytelling and oral tradition where we would use the word they as a singular um, often, like if you're thinking about Shakespeare plays, you're thinking about even actually earlier than Shakespeare, we're thinking about just plays in general, when most of the time uh, characters were actually um, male characters who were performing. Um, we would talk about they in a, in a singular way, um, you know, just to represent a singular person. So using they, them pronoun is acceptable and preferred when you don't yet know someone's pronoun. If I don't know someone's pronoun, and I can tell you by looking in the room, I don't know anybody in that room. I can't, I could not walk up to you and assume anything about you. So I'm going to use they every single time. If I don't know explicitly the pronoun that you're using, I don't make an error by assuming anything. So they is always, I think, a very safe place to arrive um, if you don't know someone's pronoun that, that they use. And even more, this might sound complicated, and it doesn't need to be, but sometimes people use more than one pronoun. Actually, I think I heard in the opening, one of um, our panelists uses multiple pronouns. Very cool, that's excellent. Um, some people might like to use all of them. I've met students who will come up to me and say, Ms. Bouchard, I use everything. And I'm like, that is fantastic. Um, so these students are ones who feel that all pronouns fit for them. Okay, When we're talking about that continuum, we're talking about the spectrum of things. Um, gender is fluid. Pronouns are fluid. So this is an example. So if someone says that they use all of them, it could be something like, my colleague uses any pronouns. He created a really informative document recently and I have a meeting about it with her tomorrow. I always look forward to meetings with them. That was three different pronouns. I don't expect anyone to leave this um, room right now feeling that they are experts on pronouns, but I am asking you to be a little bit more creative in your thinking around pronouns. And if someone identifies as all of them, let's help them in feeling comfortable in the world by trying them all out. Some people use a combination of gendered and non-binary word um, pronouns, so uh, you might find someone that uses she and they, or they and he. Again, I think it's actually really okay to ask someone to tell you more about it. If somebody uses multiple pronouns, I promise you they're not going to be offended if you say, hey, I noticed that you use multiple pronouns, can you talk to me about that? People want to talk about it. If someone is willing to tell you their pronouns, that is an invitation to ask them more. Uh, here's a quote that, um, that we wanted to share out. Much like our individual names, pronouns are tied to our deepest sense of identity. They articulate who we are and how the outside world should recognize and address us. And that, um, that to me, is kind of the foundation of the work that we're doing, is that when we are getting it right for people and their pronouns, um, we're meeting them in their most vulnerable state, which is our identity and how we, you know, how we share ourselves in the world. So I'm going to tell you, um, again, why pronouns matter, but also I want to tell you what happens, the impact that people who are trans and non-binary and people who are gender non-conforming, what happens for them when we get it wrong. I can tell you that there's annoyance. I can tell you intimately about that. Um, uh, my spouse um, is a trans person in the world. I have a lot of trans people in my life. Annoyance is probably number one. I think that there's confusion for folks. Um, the impact can be confusion. The impact can also feel like they are invisible. The impact can also be feeling disrespect. It can make folks feel unsafe. Um, being outed to observers who weren't aware of trans status, um, that's another one. I can speak all day long about trans 
lives and why this matters, but one of the things I want to really caution folks in this room to really deeply consider is that, that some, not everybody is out, right? I have students in my building that prefer that we not tell their families. They are safe in our school. We hold them. We lean in. We give them um, the safe place to explore their gender in our building, and that is sacred to school and not elsewhere. So we really want to be mindful of trans people in general too, um, especially if other people in their life don't know. Um, I think triggering internalized oppression, feeling not womanly or manly enough can happen for folks when we get it wrong. And then being targeted for violence based on their trans status. This all comes from an ally work, um, an allyship workbook by um, Davey, um, who is actually local to us um, in Massachusetts. And this is, um, this is a workbook and a resource that I highly recommend. If the library has it on hand, I would have it out on shelves. And if you don't, I think it's a great one to get in your, on your shelves. But these are the things that are cozy for our trans and non-binary folks um, when we get it wrong. So this is tip time. How can we get this right and how can we get better? So I actually want to start by saying um, this is really um, this is really an important one. I know that at Queer Connect, our board member Alyssa, who was also um, with Act Bennington, had put this note here, and it's something that I'm so cautious of now. Avoid using the phrase preferred pronouns. I see it everywhere. I see it. Um, I see it in language even at my school. We're trying to get our students to share with us their pronouns so we can get it right. But we're also kind of doing a little bit of harm by saying, what are your, prefer your preferred pronouns instead of saying things like, what are the right pronouns? Because do we want people to feel like it's a preference? Does, you know, when we are saying, what is your preferred pronoun? We are actually saying to someone, what, um, you know, this is an option for me to call you this, right? If we are now in place of saying preferred and we're saying, what is your right pronoun? Uh, or just saying what's your pronoun, now we are saying that we are respecting you and it's not an option anymore. Preferred means there's an option. It's like, when, I'm going to tell you guys a secret. My name is Jess. Um, my, uh, my legal name is Jessie Lynn. My preference is that you call me Jess, right? That means that it's optional to call me Jess. You could call me Jessie Lynn, I'm not going to be offended. But if I did say that the right name to call me is Jess, I think that that language is a little more inviting to you to know that I don't like being called Jesse Lynn. Just saying. Um, but when we are saying that there is a preferred pronoun, we are now saying to somebody, I have the option of calling you something else and getting it wrong. So what happens when we make a mistake? Okay? So first, and this is 100% of the time, and honestly, this is for like most things in life. We are going to simply apologize. We're going to simply apologize. We're going to fix. We're going to correct ourselves. We're going to we're going to we're going to repeat what you said, but with the right pronoun. And then we're going to move on. We're going to move on quickly. This is what I do in a classroom when something happens. If I've made a mistake in any particular way, so this is what it sounds like. Okay. Um, if I'm talking and I said this to a student. She stopped by earlier, and the student says, it's he. I'm going to say my three-step system. I'm sorry. He stopped by earlier to drop something off, and I've moved on. I didn't apologize in a way that made it seem, um, it, I didn't apologize in a way that made their, like, that opened up shame. It was clearly and quickly, I apologize. And then I make it correct. I correct my error and I move on. So always acknowledging the mistake, ignoring the slip up can give the impression you didn't notice or that you don't care. We don't want that. Over apologizing centers on the interaction and we want to move on. We want to move through this quickly. And then we want to use the, mo the moment for deeper connection and getting in, in, sorry, and better understanding. So when these things happen, and I, I'm going to tell you too, I'm not perfect. I've been working with LGBTQIA um, uh, organizations for a long time. I've been a teacher for a long time. I've been in the queer community myself for a long time. I don't always get it right myself. 
but this is my playbook. Apologize, correct it real fast, and then move on. So, some other tips that I have to share out with you is that being visible and vocal is really important. If you are not a part of the LGBTQIA community, I still want you to do all of these things because that is the first way to say that you are an ally. So some things that you can do is update your um, office signage. So um, I'm thinking that if I walk into your office, do I know your pronouns? Do you have something on your door that says um, your title with your pronouns? Is it visible when I walk into your space that I can, you know, I can understand your, your um, pronouns just because you've given me some signage? Things you can also do would be like um, changing your Zoom name, which is funny because right now mine just says uh, Jess Bouchard. I don't think it gave me the option of um, putting my pronouns when I signed in, but I would say putting your pronouns right on your, um, on your Zoom is good. Changing your email signature to include your pronouns is another great way that folks don't have to ask and they automatically have that information. Wearing a pronoun pin or a lanyard or a badge. I love when I see medical folks with their pronouns. I can tell you 100% of the time, LGBTQIA people, when we see pronouns like that for medical people, we're like, oh, <laughs> there's an ally, right? Like, you see me, you understand. Um, correct misgendering when you hear it. So if you are in the community, trans, sorry, if you are someone who is cisgender, you are not a part of the LGBTQIA community, please help us. If you hear the misgendering happen, move it along quickly, but help in, and help with that, um, that pronoun um, so that we can move on. And then always thank people for sharing. So one of the first things that I do when I meet anybody it doesn't matter where I am, I could be at Walmart and someone says, hey, I recognize you from somewhere. And I'm like, oh, I'm just she, her, I work with Queer Connect, right? I make it a normal practice. My students at my school, 100% of them use their pronouns every single day. When we prep them to do anything in the community, they 100% of the time say their name and their pronoun because we are a culture that wants to say that this is normal. And it is, it is very normal. So other things that I can impart with, um, and, sorry, other things that I can give you um, and, and offer to you is that when we try to avoid using gendered language, I sometimes still do it too. I might be in a space where I say the word guys. Ooh, I don't love that. <laughs> I have two small children and sometimes I, I find myself being like, hey guys, stop. And then I have to re remind myself, I'm like, why am I saying that? Why am I saying that word? So one thing that you can do is try words that is inclusive. Y'all, you don't have to be from Texas to say it's a good one, I promise. Um, <laughs> I walk in any room and I'm like, hey y'all, what's going on? <laughs> um, everybody is a good one. All of you. My most favorite is friends. Um, I will say that in most spaces. Um, if you are my colleagues, if you are my students, um, it doesn't matter if there's a group of us, I will say hey friends. Folks is another good one. So we're trying to move away from gendered language to using more inclusive language. So I'm right at the end now. Um, I know that I talked about a whole bunch of things. I gave you terms, I talked about pronouns, I talked about data, your brain might be spinning, you're like, who is this person giving me all of this information? It's me, Jess Bouchard, I use she, her pronouns, and here are some resources, Clear Connect. Um, I love getting emails from folks, I love getting volunteers, um, I love getting new board members, especially as my time at um, Queer Connect um, is uh, limited these days. Act Bennington, which is a part of the collaborative, which is also in the room, are great people who are doing excellent work for LGBTQIA people. The Trevor Project is another great one. It has data, it has um, supports. You can actually, uh, there's phone numbers that you can call if you are in crisis. Um, so that's a great one for youth, especially. Um, Gleason is another one. Um, that is another acronym for, um, you know, for similar work for gay, lesbian, straight um, folks. There's the Transgender Training Institute. There's the Family Acceptance Project. These are all within the United States. We also have that book that I referenced, which is a great one. A lot of our information has come from that. We use that as a staple for the work that we're, we're doing. There's a link here, and I can make this um, available to folks um, in some capacity. I don't know if, um, 
if there's a way to get your email addresses, if there's like a sign in there, but we can have this available to you if you want to share this out. Um, but these are some other links that you can just click on um, to have a little bit more information, especially like as you are moving through the world. People who are here today came for a reason. You might be someone who is a part of the LGBTQIA community and you grab your folks to come with you. You might be someone who's in, um, you know, in the medical world who wants a little bit more information. You might be working in the library. You might be a teacher. You might be um, construction. You could be anybody who came today to be in this place for this conversation. And so I want all of you to walk away having some tools. I'm going to stop my share because I'm done with um, just this part of things and bring it back um, and say thank you again for um, giving me this opportunity to share this really important work with you. Jess, thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. I hope you can stick up around you. I also wanted to let you know that inside the brochure from tonight, if you haven't gotten one, there's some more on the way out. There's all of the, a lot of the information from Jess's presentation is in there. Um, so you have it in one spot, and a lot of the resources are on the back page. Um, so now I'd like to uh, invite Corey to come back up and uh, Test, 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 test. Test, 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 I am really, really, really grateful that you guys are here. Um, honestly, it takes like a lot of courage to come explore something that you might not be familiar with. And as a member of the queer community myself, I just really appreciate that you guys took the time this evening in the middle of the week on a really hot summer day. So thanks so much. Um, mostly, I kind of want to just take you guys down a little bit of journey of what has been. Can you see up a little bit? Sure. Mostly I want to take you guys down a little bit of a journey of what it's been to be a trans person in the United States over kind of the last hundred years. Is that a little better? Just check it back in. Good. Um, and so bear with me. It's a lot of kind of data, but I'm going to move through it quickly. Um, and then just to be clear, Corey Bell, I'm a family nurse practitioner at Baton Hill Valley Community Health. I am a gender affirming care provider. Uh, I prefer he, him, they, them, and since I've been encouraged to discuss that a little bit more, my reason for preferring they, them in addition to he, him is because visibility is important to me. Um, and I also think that probably most humans on the spectrum don't necessarily feel a certain gender or sex every day, and myself included. Some days I just wake up and I'm just Corey, and um, those are my they, them days. <laughs> so I must say, when I'm saying the word transgender in this conversation, it's, I'm using it as a blanket inclusive term which isn't my preference, but it's really hard to make distinctive data versus like the little subcategories of our community. So it's an all-inclusive term for people that don't necessarily identify with their sex assigned at birth. That can mean a lot of things. I also want to say that the resources I use to collect this are really extensive, and if you have specific questions about anything I say, or you're like, hey, I really want to know more about that one thing that guy mentioned, please ask me. Uh, I have all kinds of resources that I'm happy to share as well. So, meat and potatoes. What's gender affirming care? What does that mean, honestly? So really, gender affirming care, all it means is that we're affirming how somebody's gender identity or expression is. That kind of breaks down into a couple of domains in the medical community. The first domain being social. So that's the things we talked about, like your name, your pronouns, how you present, if you will, so that's a like whether I wear makeup, whether I'm going to wear you know, a hockey jersey today, all those things matter to people, um, and especially to, to trans people who are trying to express who they are to you and to the community. The other domain of this, which is kind of my domain to some extent, is the medical part. And so some people, as we know, have a gender identity that they decide they want to express, and there are medical ways that can assist with this, although it's absolutely not everybody's journey. Um, and so that's hormone therapy, that's gender, I mean, sorry, that's um, puberty blockers, that's surgeries for some people. So for some people, that's just calling you what you want me to call you in my medical office. And so that, that's a wide scope, but um, that's kind of what I want to touch on today. So what, is this, what does this look like, classically? Um, not good, <laughs> you know, and so I want to say, you know, gender variance is not this, like, new contemporary thing where I'm like, oh, like, 
we're having this discussion because we're in the 2020s. We are so old to the game. It's been documented since like the beginning of written history, verbal history in humans. There's been some fluctuants and variants of what gender means across cultures, across the world. A good example of this is uh, actually, they're called hijaras. This is something new to me and I wanted to share it with you guys because I came across it. So hijaras are trans feminine people. So what that means is people that express sort of more of a feminine, contemporary feminine version of, of gender. Um, and they existed in Southeast Asia for like thousands of years. And the cool thing I found about this was actually in the cultures, particularly Nepal and India, they're highly regarded. Like these are like spiritual people that do blessings at weddings, bless homes, churches. They also are known to be capable of potentially cursing. <laughs> you know, and so it's, it's, it's kind of a neat thing and actually India, of all places, in 2014 recognized this as a third gender, so it's like, if they're doing this in India, like, <laughs> you know, we might be a little bit behind. Um, and so, yeah, other examples which Jess touched on is two-spirit, which I think a lot of people have some familiarity with, so that's like an indigenous native term that really spans a lot of the Americas and Canada, um, and many different tribal nations, and it's really just kind of meaning that you don't identify necessarily with strictly masculine or feminine, you're somewhere between both energies in the universe. Um, and so I think that that's really neat. Um, so yeah, so back to access to care. This is sort of the gravity moment. I'm going to bring you down, but I promise I'll bring you back up. And so really formally recognized gender affirming care internationally has been documented for about 100 years. In 1919, there was a really interesting guy named Magnus Hirschfeld who started what's called uh, the Institute for Sexual Science in Berlin, Germany. Um, this was really a huge change in culture. Prior to that time, how they treated transvestites, as we were called at that time, <laughs> um, which is a dated term, was to fix us. You know, like, let's find a way to fix you. This is all kinds of things. Like, you know, really into the 50s and 60s, it became like, put everybody in therapy, they did shock therapy, lobotomies. So 1919, we're talking over 100 years ago, this interesting guy who's a phys physicist and sexologist gets together funds for this clinic. By 1930, they've done the first internationally documented, medically supervised gender-affirming surgery. Um, they started to kind of explore with hormones and things. That was perfected later in the 50s. Um, and so yeah, so let's move into the 40s. Everybody may have heard of Alfred Kinsey, the, the sexologist that did a lot of data collection on what kind of sexual behaviors humans have, not just necessarily trans or homosexual people. Um, and so he coined the term transsexual. So we moved away from like transvestite, which is sort of like a, an ugly term, and we moved into transsexual, which is also now dated because gender and sexuality are different things, as is sex and gender. Um, and so 1950s, probably one of the biggest, like most well-known transitions was Christine Jorgensen. Does anybody familiar with that name? So she, she was a, a really well-regarded member of the military, a GI, who actually went to Berlin and had pretty openly gender-affirming surgery, hormonal treatment, and it was kind of like a, a national spectacle at the time. People were really interested in it for good and bad reasons, and so that was sort of like the first real introduction to America. Like, this is something that people are doing. It's, it's a medical possibility. And then we get to the 60s, where there's this gentleman named Dr. Harry Benjamin, who was an endocrinologist in New York City, who started what we call now YPATH, which is the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. So like, they make guidelines that make things safe and uniform. Sometimes it's a little controversial, but and basically it's like how the medical doctors and professionals, you go and you expect to get a standard of care, and so should trans people have, and so they kind of regulate that. So we're, we're in the 1960s at this point. That's four or five decades ago now. Nothing really happens until 2014. People are getting access to care, but it's not with insurance. So 2014 is when commercial insurance is get on board. So this really happens in a reversal of a Medicare ruling that happened in 1981 that banned insurances from paying for, paying for transgender related care. Um, so that was reversed in 2014, and this opened like a lot of access to care. Now, people were getting care otherwise, but it wasn't really safe or medically supervised, or it was a cash service. And I'm one of those people, I'm old enough that I, when I first had access to hormones, I was actually living in Bennington and driving out to Brattleboro and paying an endocrinologist out of pocket when I'm trying to get through like nursing school when I'm like, you know, 20-something years old. So, still a pretty recent thing. Um, 
And so yeah, so four or five decades of this ambiguity. Um, and then nowadays, what I'm really passionate about is taking it out of like the niche specialists. So endocrinologists, they're like the doctors that treat diabetes, treat hormonal disorders, thyroid. That's a pricey doctor. <laughs> you know, insurance-wise, likewise. Um, I think that, you know, the, the momentum on this is now there's all kinds of, of gender-affirming care clinics that pop up or, or LGBTQ clinics, but they're really like quite urban, you know, like the closest ones to us are probably Albany, Boston, New York City, and so kind of my interest was like, what do we do in these rural areas? Um, so it should really be part of primary care. You go to your doctor and you like want to talk to them about the bump on your back, and then you should also be able to talk to them about like what your gender expression is going to look like and, and how your life should be. Um, and so, yeah, so it really wasn't until 2019 where there was access to gender affirming care services online. So people that lived in like highly rural areas that could not travel are now able to get services. You obviously can't have surgery online or things like that, but it opens, opens a door that otherwise was not able to be accessed by many people. So yeah, so what does the data tell us now? I think Jess touched on a lot of this, so I don't have to like feed your depression too much tonight. <laughs> um, but yeah, so despite progress, it's still not good, you know? So yeah, LGBTQI, everybody, you know, everybody that falls under that umbrella are really far more likely to have poor mental health, poor physical health um, than our cisgender counterparts. Um, cisgender, by the way, is sort of means on the side of, so that means people that identify with their gender. Trans means on the other side, whatever that means. So I guess against whatever your, your sex at birth aside was. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this better? No, no different. I'll just talk about it. Yep. She's going to turn that now. Hello? Hello? Hi. Okay. So, despite progress, LGBTQI people are, are far more likely to have negative health, health outcomes, as I was saying. Uh, and some of those things are, are you know, Pretty common things, higher rates of tobacco use, cardiovascular disease, sexual and physical violence, substance abuse, and most notably those really highly increased suicide rates. And that's more noted in trans youth, but it's also very present in trans adults. So lifetime prevalence of contemplating suicide in, a, in someone with a trans identity is like 80%, whereas general population is something like 30%. And a history of a sincere attempt in a trans population is about 30%, and the general population, it's about 8%. So that's like a fairly dramatic difference. Um, yeah, like 28% of transgender people will report postponing necessary procedures, medical care, in the year prior on surveys due, due to fear of discrimination, with one in two people kind of reporting some type of mistreatment at the hands of a medical professional, which is astounding to me. That's not like in my lifetime, that's in the last year that I received care, one out of two transgender people had a very negative experience where they constituted as mistreatment. That's including but not limited to care refusal, misgendering, verbal, and physical abuse. Um, and then one in three transgender people report having to teach their doctor how to take care of them. Basically like going to your doctor and having to tell them what kind of care you need to meet your health needs. So what's like the root cause of this? Like, why, why are we still like stuck in this sort of muddy area, if you will? I think it's like really complicated. If you, you know, I don't think there's one particular thing, but the two things that, that come to mind, and one of the things we can address here is just a lack of knowledge in the general population, but also a lack of knowledge for providers. Um, and you know, I've been, I've been to nursing school and nurse practitioner school. I think when I went to nursing school, which was 2008, we had maybe one part of a chapter, basically on, it said LGBTQ, and it was, you know, not even a full chapter, a couple paragraphs, sort of a broad scope. By the time I hit nurse practitioner school, which was uh, 2018, we had a full chapter, so yay. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's really the extent of formal education people get. Now, thankfully, in 2022, the Center for Disease Control, our best friend through COVID, as we all know, did release this large module um, that's free to any healthcare providers, whether you provide primary care, whether you're a dentist, whether you're a therapist, that help you create safe spaces, but also interact with your patients in the way that you're serving their needs. So like, how, do we, how do we address what's going on? Um, this, this is how we address it. You know, like, you guys are kind of part of, of the solution here. Um, you know, when they talk to 
Jess talked about this a lot, they did this sort of what's called a meta-analysis. So they looked at tons of studies about youth that had suicide attempts that were in the sort of trans umbrella. And there were two common themes that they noted. Um, the first one was thwarted belongingness. So that means your sense of belonging to something is diminished, reduced, crushed down. And the other one is perceived burdensomeness. So like these kids that they talked to, which the ranges were age 11 to 17, live their life feeling like their identity is a burden to society, their parents, their friends, their peers, their school. For being a, you know, a young person, those are two really huge concepts, you know, like to be able to express that at that age means you've already had a fair amount of suffering to, to be able to articulate that. Um, and so, kind of as Jess spoke to, it really doesn't take a lot to make a person feel safe. Um, and doing that and taking the time to do stuff like this, you might be the only person in somebody's day or week that actually acknowledges them for who they are and, and affirms who they are, and that really is life-saving. Um, absolutely. So what's good, Corey? You just depressed us all. What's going right? Um, and so yeah, so the CDC, as I said, did that awesome program, and I, I think that the cool thing about that is it's not like having providers start a gender-affirming care practice. It's just like, how do we make what we have work better? Um, and then also, a lot of the civil rights era laws did huge progress to prevent discrimination, but they were vague. And so one of the other things that's happened in legislation in the last like five, 10 years is like revisiting a lot of these 70s era laws and saying, do they actually protect my sexual identity, my sexual orientation, my gender identity, my gender expression? And the Supreme Court largely says, yes, yeah, this, this falls under the inclusions of many of those laws. So what does that mean? It means that healthcare programs that accept federal funding, such as Medicare, Medicaid, a lot of clinics, um, they actually have to comply with the federal law and offer non-discriminatory care. Whether or not that happens perfectly, absolutely not, but it's good to know that we have some federal protections, which is quite new. Um, and then, yeah, like I spoke to a little bit, my passion project is really like making gender affirming care just routine care. It shouldn't be this like difficult to access specialty thing, and it doesn't have to be highly medical or complex, including surgeries, hormones, all of that, although that's part of it. And I think if you have people in your life or are questioning yourself, I highly encourage you to have a discussion with your provider or provider that you feel safe with. Um, but it's really just about, you know, the places we all go and need, which healthcare is one of them, making that inclusive and, and safe and real and helpful. Um, and then, yeah, the last thing I, I wanted to mention is, while we have some federal protections, the state legislation stuff is still difficult. So that's all state by state. Um, you know, the southeast part of the United States probably has the biggest struggles, you know, just sporadically through the Midwest and other parts of the country. But, um, in Vermont, we're very lucky, and so like, I hope we continue to have people that, that vote in, in ways that treat everybody like humans, because that's what we are. We all kind of come out of the womb and just try to figure out the life, and if you have a little support, it, it, it makes it all that much easier. Um, the, la the sort of last little shout out I want to have is there is something called the Vermont Diversity Health Project, and what that does is they, one of the things they do is they have a database of basically gender affirming and, and just trans-friendly providers, and so like it can be as simple as, hey, I went to my eye doctor and that interaction was a little bit weird, let me see if I can find somebody else. And so there's this really inclusive database that actually providers sign up for themselves, and so I encourage you, if you're seeking care, somebody's seeking care, whether it be gender-affirming or not, to, to use that resource. Um, yeah, and so mine was a little short and sweet, but that's kind of what I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, and yeah, I really, really am grateful for you guys being here. Like this, this is how we make change happen, and this is how, this is how we prevent people from going to dark places that we wouldn't want people to go.